Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. That's great. Thank you very much there. Good morning. Wow, what a turnout it is today. Uh, I'm a grateful alcoholic. My name is William. William. Uh, my home group is the Prince Edward Group in Toronto. I guess we have uh, on Mondays at 8 p.m. we have an open meeting. Uh, we do have a women's meeting as well at 7 p.m. on Mondays. So all you women, you're welcome to come. And as well, on Mondays at 8 p.m., we actually have the only one and only in-person Alateen meeting, which uh, is a great gift to our community and, uh, yeah, as a whole, which is fantastic. And on Wednesdays, we have a closed meeting at 8 p.m. where we have uh, step studies and big book. Yet, uh, I do apologize. I'm a little nervous. It's been a while, but yet uh, I'm glad to be here, and it's definitely an honor to participate in AA in any capacity. Yet, uh, yeah, you know, this subject, parenting, you know, some of the boys and myself, I guess, male, I guess, members of our group, you know, sometimes we, I try to touch on this subject, and yet it's almost like a taboo, because I know, I'm not sure about you, whether you're male or female, I failed, I guess, as a parent, I guess, uh, being an alcoholic, and yet my priorities were not my children, obviously was my disease, and yet it's cunning, baffling, powerful, you know, even though, you know, my intention was, you know, I will do everything to care for my children, but yet when I was in the grips of my disease, it was obviously uh, not my priority, So, which is unfortunate. However, I've got only a quick, I guess, 25 minutes, and I'm going to do this as quick as I can. Uh, however, I guess I want to really thank the committee, I guess, putting on this uh, ORC onto a regional conference. It takes two years to put this together, and I know that for a fact because I was on it 2017, and yet it's a dedication, and I'm forever grateful for them. Yet, um, one thing that I didn't realize as well, which was parenting, you know, until I came into AA, I never valued parenting as a privilege. You know, I thought it was, you know, just a course of action. It's like, okay, we get married, we have kids, and you know what? We have a great career, built, have a home, and that is that. And, you know, I come to understand that I came from a dysfunctional family. At the time, I wasn't aware of that. And uh, yet, it was brought to my attention that uh, yet my values were not norm, far from norm. And um, yet, I guess uh, that's uh, many of the gifts of this program. Because growing up, I'm a Toronto kid, just uh, grew up up the street, not far from here, Spadine and Bloor. And yet, you know, I guess. Um, just growing up in the area that it was, it was quite common for, you know, us kids, you know, teenagers to just dabble in things. And yet uh, I had my first drink at the age of 10 for cigarettes and uh, first joint at 13, 16, my first line. I basically I quit school between at the age of 17 and at 21 I hit my first bottom and unfortunately I did not find the beautiful rooms of the AA program or NA or what have you. However, um, I found a beautiful naturopath doctor who basically prescribed supplements for me to wean me off all the substances and alcohol and I was able to go back to school and I thank to the encouragement of my wife Judith and uh, yet who encouraged me and I was able to basically educate myself find a good career and that was basically mid 20s and uh, yet uh, late 20s we had our first child at 28 31 we had our second and yet Life to me was perfect, and unfortunately, I uh, stand you before you now because I had my second bottom at the age of 38. Initially, I thought I was cured from all my diseases, and uh, yet at the age of 38, when I hit my second bottom, I didn't. I had a difficult understanding classifying myself as an alcoholic. Why? At home, in our garage, we had a beer fridge for guests. 
within our house, we had a liquor cabinet for guests, okay? So I never drank at home. Even to this day, if you ask my kids, you know, have you ever seen your dad drink? They would say, absolutely not. So, you know, like many alcoholics, you know, especially when we're green in sobriety, I thought, how can I, how can my drinking be affecting others around me when they never witnessed it, right? But I come to understand that all the promises that I've made, you know, when I'm sober to my children, it's like, oh, we'll go to Canada's Wonderland, we'll go on field trips, we'll go on family vacations, and we'll do a lot of shopping and what have you and have a lot of fun. I come to understand that I never fulfilled those promises, and yet, why? Because I'm typically nursing my hangovers, and yet, uh, and it was a great disappointment to my children. You know, I guess um, it seems as though during, I guess, uh, pardon me, uh, during my act of drinking, it was apparent to my spouse that uh, my drinking was affecting my kids. Even though I didn't drink every day, that was my dilemma as well because I was primarily a weekend drinker, so I thought I was just a, uh, I guess, a heavy drinker. But however, just being in these rooms, uh, for a short time, I come to understand that, you know, it's what happens to me when I pick up that first drink. I can't stop. And yet then my goal becomes, I guess, I just want to drink until I black out. And uh, yet it's not very ambitious as I come to understand. But uh, my wife had stated that uh, the girls, I have two daughters, and uh, and they were fearful of me. They would run from me when they heard my truck pull in. Is that me? I heard my, when they hear the truck pull in, they would basically run to the room because they don't know. If dad had a good day, the house would be peaceful. If I had a terrible day at work, they would get the brunt of it, unfortunately. And I wasn't aware of the, my actions. And um, unfortunately, or fortunately for the kids and the family and my wife, I was removed from the house. I was kicked out of the home, and at which point, I basically went back to my mom's house down in the annex and uh, at Spadina and Bloor, and that's when my drinking accelerated even more. However, I had my kids. I was a part-time parent, I guess. Every two weeks, I had my kids, and occasionally I hear this, I hear this phrase, you know, from my eldest daughter, Robin. I think she was nine at the time. She had stated, um, "Dad, have you heard of AA?" I looked down at her and I said. Young lady, bite your tongue. Those adults are brainwashing you, don't you know? It's a cult following. Your dad is a leader, not a follower. <laughs> wow, talk about ego, yeah. And yet she was eight, I was what, 38? She was eight or nine, I was 38, I'm looking at her. And yet, you know, I've had the kids on several occasions and I will hear this quite often, this phrase about AA. And yet, you know what, I thought, I'm gonna put a stop to this. You know what, I told my daughter, I said, I'll go to one meeting, one meeting only, just to prove how much of a farce it is, okay? You know, because like business, you can't have an honest opinion unless you basically go through the motions and try it and experience it, right? So she runs down the hall to her mother at the time and says, Daddy said yes, Daddy said yes. And then the mom came and approached me, and this was January 2008. Yeah, you know what, there's a good meeting in March, you know, and I thought, it's January now. I might change my mind between now and then. So yet, you know, guess what? That day came, March 14th, 2008. It was a Friday. And I was approached by my wife, Judith, and she said, remember that promise you made? I go, what promise? It's like, uh, you would go to that one, that AA meeting. I said, I got plans this evening. It's like, okay, it's a one hour meeting. Let's hurry up. And she said, okay, let's get in the car. I said, where are we going? I didn't even know where I was going. She says, it's downtown. She packed the kids. She was in the car and I'm thinking, why would the kids be coming with me? And yet, long and behold, we live in the east, or sorry, the west end by Old Mill and Bloor. So we hopped onto the gardener basically went eastbound. She says, get off at Bay Street. So we got off at Bay Street. I'm, as I'm going due north over that ridge, that bridge there, and I say, oh, look at that, Royal York Hotel. She says, yeah, that's where it is. And I thought, ha, 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 to myself, it's like, oh, high society, maybe I belong here. It's like, <laughs> it's like, there's my ego again. And yet, so we pull into the valet parking, and yet I threw the keys over to the valet parker, parking fellow, nice gentleman. She popped the trunk, and, and she had these two bags, and I thought, uh, excuse me, what's this all about? Oh, it's a weekend conference. It's the Ontario Regional Conference. Yeah, it's... 
As an alcoholic, as you know, better than me, as well as me, we don't like to cause a scene in public, right? But when we reached the room up above, and behind closed doors, my, did I have some choice words, yeah. And I thought, boy, if looks could kill, she would have been dead right by the valley parker there. So yet, there's my two kids. I was just enraged within myself. And I just stormed out of the room. I think it was a 7 o'clock meeting, an open speaker meeting, the, uh, I guess the grand opening and, uh, of the conference. And I kind of just, you know, stumbled my way into the back. I sat in the back room there. And yet there I was, you know, just judging. It's like, oh, look, everybody has gray hair here. I'm just too young for this. It's like, oh, and then I'm looking at the demographics. You know, I'm going, you know, it's like I don't see many Asians here at all. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's like I- I'm making any excuse to try to leave, right? And I'm just judging all of you. So, you know what? I assure you, if you are new and you're sitting in these rooms this weekend and you feel uncomfortable and yet you're judging me and others, you know, and you don't want to be here, welcome, because I am you. And yet, you know, to this day, I'm just beyond amazed at the gifts of this program. And yet, I'm just going to briefly share with you uh, what they were. And to my discovery, hi, honey. Yeah, I'm willing to share the microphone with you as well. <laughs> I got a fan. Woohoo! Anyhow, um, yet, you know, I came to understand that I found out my youngest, my eldest daughter, Robin, at the time, who always kind of nudged me with that phrase AA. When I initially came in, I found out that she had one year of. I guess, Alateen, I guess, attendance. And my wife, I, she had two years as a member of Al-Anon. And yet, we have the younger daughter, Jaslyn. She was only seven. And yet, she said, you know, since all you guys are going to meetings, I want to go to a meeting, too. And it's like, oh, OK. And as you know, Alateen typically is from the age of 10 and 20. So the home group, the Alateen home group, had basically a, I guess, uh, a group conscience, and they voted. They had a discussion, they had a vote, and they accepted my youngest daughter, who was seven years old, to be a member of Alateen, which was a great gift. Even though she didn't comprehend the dialogue that took place, she just had a coloring book, and we gave her crayons. She just kind of doodled until she grasped it. And yet, when she did, this is a seven-year-old now, okay? We, um, you know how we have AA closed meetings, we have a discussion, there's a chairperson, what have you? We had the same meetings at home. Unfortunately, the topic of discussion is usually my irregular actions, and yet, you know what, as the qualifier, you know, and, you know, I always felt as though, you know, I was being, what, punished, but yet, you know, one day, I think one of the girls, one, I can't remember if it was Robin or uh, Judith, my wife, was chirping about me, and they were probably right, you know what, about my actions, you know, was really inappropriate, what have you, and insulting, and yet, you know, me being an alcoholic, I got a strong opinion, so I couldn't hold myself back, and I said, well, let me justify this, and yet, that seven-year-old, okay, who was chairing the meeting, okay, <laughs> you know, she said to me, Dad, no cross-talking. It's like, whoa, hey, what happened there? Did I just hear what I heard? And I, yet, and I thought, you know what? That was such a pivotal moment. Why? For the first time, I'm going to get emotional, sorry. For the first time, our family found their voice. Prior to that, the only voice in the household was mine. And yet, you know, I had to humble myself. And yet that was such a revelation. From that moment on, our family, you know, basically was able to represent themselves, and yet they put me in my place, which I had to be, you know, and you know, this was such a gift, and I never realized that until later. And as, you know, the years progressed, the first year, the second year, the third year, you know, I was on this pink cloud. Everybody had a program of their own, and yet, you know, I thought life was perfect. You know, and one thing, during my third year, what had happened was, while I'm riding this pink cloud, I'm doing all the service in my home group, and yet we own a 
I guess a company, we're self-employed, and yet I wouldn't pick up a broom on a job site, let alone, you know, I guess, you know, bag any garbage. But, you know, I guess the my sponsor said to me, Willie, you got to stack those chairs. I go, oh, you know what? I don't think I could do that. It's like, oh, no. Stack those chairs. You, upon that, after you complete that, we can make coffee. And I, I took on all these service positions. I had to humble myself, and yet I was the purchaser. Even though I had a strong opinion about things, you know, I had to basically, you know, I guess really work and give back to this community of AA because I'm a taker. I'm not sure about you, but I'm basically selfish to the core, and yet I'm always taking, never giving, and yet for once I was giving and it felt great. You know, and I come to learn that it's not about receiving gifts, it's about giving gifts. And this was new to me and quite foreign. And yet, here I am riding this pink cloud, life seemed to be perfect. And uh, yet, I was rocked to my knees. Like somebody pulled the carpet right underneath me. What happened? Robin, my eldest daughter, at the time I think she's 12 or 13, who basically brought me uh, to the rooms of AA, she fell into a depression. I've never felt such pain ever in sobriety. I lost my mother a year and a half ago. It wasn't as painful as witnessing your daughter, your child, falling into a depression. I don't know what depression is. I never heard of it until I came to the rooms of AA. I heard one member discuss about his depression and how he has dealt with it. and. You know, it rocked me to my knees, and this um, this higher power was new with me. I don't I don't come from a religious background. I have nothing against religion, but it was foreign to me. And when I found out my daughter fell into this depression, I fell to my knees. I fell to my knees, and I had a fist, and I said, I was on one hand and on my knees, and I said, if there's a God out there, please give me the power to find help for my daughter. I went online after consulting with our fellow member of AA. He told me, go online, you'll find some help. We searched and we searched and thankfully we found a service who dealt with young kids who suffer from depression under the age of 16. And yet our entire family was interviewed by this establishment. And it was determined that I had contributed to her depression. Even though I wanted to blame the swimming coach for her depression because she swam on a national level in synchronized swimming, that rocked me. And the doctor she said, there'll be two and a half years of therapy for you and your daughter if you want help twice a week. At that time, I had no choice, and I just wanted to save her. She couldn't get out of her bed. She had no appetite. She was just like almost like a vegetated state, and yet I, I contributed to that. And I felt, I felt really bad for this, for her. After two and a half years, twice a week, you know, she learned to deal with her depression. She got out of that funk. She got better. Our whole family got better. I stayed with this program. And yet, you know, she, she, in her studies, she went to U of T to study psychology. Why? She wanted to learn about her depression and how to deal with her own symptoms. And not just that, she wanted to help others. Last, last week, University of Massachusetts in Boston accepted her master's application and PhD for psychology. And I said to her, I said, honey, after you graduate, since we design and we build, I said, I'll come down to the US and I'll open, I'll build a practice for you. She says, why would you want me to build a practice in the US? I said, honey, there's more money in private healthcare. <laughs> This is her reaction. She says, Dad, I don't care about the money. I just want to help people. 
and I want my practice in Canada because there's funding. It's like, wow, that was another awakening for me because, you know, I forget, you know, about sometimes I need to be reminded about the principle of our program, you know. One thing that you guys have taught me here in these rooms of AA is that my children might look somewhat like me, you know, and in my mind, you know, you know, as a young kid, when you make paper mache, you know, whatever you create, you think you can basically, you know, abuse or, or ruin even. It's like, you know, if you make a paper mache, you don't like it, you just crush it and then you just make another, right? But yet, you know, I come to terms with myself that they might look a bit like me, but this is God's creation. You know what? She's a child of God, my children. You're a child of God. The deal I got with my higher power is this. I believe that if I help God's children, I believe my higher power would help me. So, you know what? It's all about giving rather than taking. You know, that young, that young daughter, the seven-year-old, who was chairing that closed meeting, we opened the, chair, the closed meetings at home with the sobriety, uh, serenity prayer, sorry. And yet, that young girl, I guess she was seven years old. I think after a year or a year and a half, being in Alateen, you know what she said to me? She's, she says, Dad, you know if you go back out, we're not waiting for you. And at that moment, I stared at my shoes and I said, I understand, dear. I don't want you to wait for me if I go back out. You know, it's been such a blessing. Sorry to be emotional. But it's been such a blessing that our family have received tremendous, many, many gifts. And there's many of you in my family. Cannot thank you guys enough. The Alateen program, who helped us with our children. The Al-Anon program, who helped my wife. You know, this weekend, it's really emotional for me because it's exactly 16 years to the day that I came into these rooms. And I came here for the wrong reasons initially. But I assure you today, I'm here for the right reasons. And yet, as long as I listen to you all and I help God's children, I believe that God would help me. Our family can never, ever repay. Alateen, Alanon, AA. So we serve. My wife is in charge of the Alateen program. And yet, that one meeting that we have on Mondays at 8 p.m., is we've seen the, the many, many gifts and miracles, not just within our own children, but other children who attend that meeting. And yet, you know, it's so motivating. You know, in AA, I know it's a sem sensitive topic about talking about our kids. If we reap the rewards and the gifts of the AA program, the Al-Anon program, don't you think your kids deserve the same gifts, you know? I definitely do. And yet, you know, on that note, I know there's, it's a fabulous weekend. Sorry for being emotional, but this is a, a very soft spot, a, a really sensitive place for me to be, and I'm really proud to be here today after 16 years. But yet, there's phenomenal AA speakers, Al-Anon speakers. However, there's a fabulous Alateen speaker that traveled from Michigan, the state of Michigan in the U.S. There won't be a dry eye in that room after she's done. I want you to hear her message. If you can basically take out that moment to basically attend that Alateen main speaker meeting, you'll be floored. And yet the message is clear. So thank you all. I'm glad you're all here. And I, our family couldn't thank you enough for my sobriety. is amazing <laughs> and what an amazing share and what an amazing um, journey you've had in recovery and just so touched by your openness and your vulnerability because as shame-based people we don't really want to illuminate into the darker sides especially when it comes to kids so 
Thank you for sharing that message today. It was really powerful. And I also share the same sobriety date as you, March 14th. So happy birthday to you. Yeah. And this is just a thank you from the committee for your time today. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Amazing. That was amazing. Um, I'm very pleased um, to introduce our next panelist, Cara from the Pacific Group in California. Good morning. My name is Cara Bear. I'm an alcoholic. And it's so nice to be here from LA. Um, it's also, your baby is so beautiful. Um, I am like, I could also, if you guys want to vote, I can just hold them up and we can all stare at the baby for 20 minutes <laughs> and then leave. Because uh, um, we actually dropped our baby off with my parents in Minnesota. And then we took a little road trip through Akron and Chicago and Buffalo to come here to be with you guys this weekend. And it's our first uh, time really away from our daughter. Daughter. And who? Oh, um, but I'm really happy to see yours. Um, it really warms my heart. Um, so I don't, being that I only have a one year old, I don't have a ton of experience to share, but I hope I have a lot of hope. Um, and I have a lot to say about what AA has given me as a parent and just as a, as a person who is entering this journey of raising a little being. Um, I never thought I wanted to be a parent. You know, um, I'm an artist, and so by nature I am uh, introspective, which means self-obsessed. And then you add alcohol to that, and I don't care about anyone or anything else. Um, I had these huge ambitions and goals and dreams, um, both before and since getting sober. And so becoming a mom, it was something that was never high on my priority list. Um, when I was out there, I did get pregnant and I ended up terminating that pregnancy. Um, and I'm not here to, you know, villainize or cheer for abortion, but I, what I will say is I was not someone who would have been able to take care of a child at that time. Um, and the guilt and shame of that followed me into sobriety. It helped fuel my drinking, of course. Um, and then it also helped fuel this image of God that was this, this punishing higher power, you know, who would hold that against me for the rest of my life. And so I carried that weight with me um, as I, you know, journeyed, journeyed through my time. So I end up getting sober. I got sober um, in LA. I'd been living in New York for quite a while. I hopped over to LA for you know a week. I ended up getting sober, staying, and meeting this man in the front row who you can hear today at 1 p.m. Um, and I uh, settled down there and I, um, I started a new life. And all of the little things that happened, have happened throughout my sobriety, are really what have prepared me for parenting, in my opinion. So one of the things I will thank my husband for is he really taught me that relationships are work. Um, and I know the speaker last night said it too. And they are, you know, they're wonderful, they're the best thing ever, but they're work. And they're, it's continuous, you know? And he taught me that if I lay off the gas pedal for a little while, I'm going to reap the rewards of that, right? But if I keep uh, putting time and effort and energy into the relationships in my life, not just my marriage, but my relationship with God, with my sponsor, with my friends, and with my daughter, right? That's how I build these great connections. Um, and if I, if I don't want to do that, then I'm going to see those relationships start to dwindle. And I actually have power in that. Right? Like, I actually have a choice. Am I going to put time into this or am I not? Um, and then another thing that was really big is uh, when I, I left home at 18, I moved to New York to become a famous actress. And I decided I would never, I changed my name. I was never going to talk to my parents again. 
you know, except for holidays, because they would fly me home, and they would feed me, and sometimes, you know, my mom was a big traveler for work, so sometimes I'd get bumped to first class, and I could drink as much as I wanted, and that was really rewarding, but having to sit with them for a week was so uncomfortable, um, and you know, they would, they would call, my grandma would call, and I would see her name pop up, and I would just watch it. I would watch the phone ring until it went to voicemail, and then I'd put it down, and I'd try to forget, and I would feel so ashamed of that, um, and it gave me even more reason to drink because I didn't want to face the fact that I was absent in my life, you know, and not a member of my own family. But what AA gave me was the opportunity to make amends for that behavior and to start to really develop a relationship with my family. And I got to, um, you know, I got to start calling my parents. I'm not a big phone person, you know, coming in. Didn't, I didn't like calling the pizza guy, you know, so I wasn't going to call my family. But I heard people share, like, I started making amends to my family by just calling them on Sundays. So I started doing that. I would, I would call my folks, and I'd be like, um, hey, it's me. How are you? You know, and they'd be like, oh, uh, well, you guys know the Minnesota. We're really good, honey. How are you? You know? And I'd be like, oh, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm good. And then I didn't know what else to say. So I'd be like, okay, bye, talk to you next week. You know? And then that developed and developed. Um, and now I have two best friends that I never wanted. You know? Um, and I talk to my family all the time. And they were there, you know, when we got pregnant. We were neither trying nor not trying to get pregnant, but I had that idea that I mentioned that God was punishing me, and so I probably never would get pregnant anyway, um, because, you know, that's that spiteful higher power had closed off my ovaries to conception. And so I, um, and I, I, I had worked on my higher power and on that relationship, but I still had these old ideas. So I was very surprised when I got pregnant. And I wasn't ready, you know? And I'm not a young mom, so it was, it was time, you know? Um, but I got pregnant, and I was just like, oh, no. But I had made this sort of pact with myself um, based on, you know, my past experience that if I did get pregnant, I was going to keep it. And my husband felt the same. Like, if it happened, we would have it. If it didn't, we would just be a, a childless couple, and that would be fine. But there she was, implanted um, in Fiji, of all places. And so, um, you know, we I decided um, I still wasn't sure if I wanted to be a parent. I just, I didn't know. I wasn't sure if I was excited to have a kid. Um, but I knew that I was keeping her. And so my uh, sponsor had taught me in AA to act as if right? Like, it doesn't matter how you feel. If you're keeping her, then you better act as if you really want that baby. And so I did everything I could to, to give her like a, a clean and solid temple in which to grow. Uh, and it was not an easy pregnancy. Um, and it was not an easy labor. And I will tell you, you know, I stayed very active. I was secretarying a meeting. I was going to a bunch of meetings while I was pregnant. I was, um, you know, very active in my home group still. Um, and I was able to connect with all these other women there who had also um, had kids or, or were pregnant at the time. And we have this, like, lovely little group now where we can, we can text each other and be like, this weird thing is happening. What is that? Um, and for, you know, we share in a general way, so I'm not going to, you know, uh, expose you to that. But, you know, just stuff like that where we can say, oh, my God, will this ever heal, you know? Um, and so I remember telling one of these women, you know, I'm going to have this baby, and I'm scared that I'm not going to love her. And, um, geez, I want to call this the crying panel because I think that's what it's going to be. Um, and a woman in my home group who had recently had a kid who was about six months said, I didn't love my daughter when she was born, you know? Um, it took some time, and that's okay. 
And so I was prepared going in there with lots of like set aside prayers too, of just being like, please let me, you know, have this open mind and a new experience and whatever happens, happens. If I don't love this thing, I will still like protect it and care for it as if I do until I can. Um, and when I gave birth, my husband and my best friend, who was my first sponsor, were in the room. And they stood by my side for 39 hours um, while I, like, tried to dilate and couldn't. Uh, and they were there when Sloan came out. And they took her and they set her on my chest, skin to skin. And I fell madly in love with this little girl. <laughs> And my heart just exploded because I didn't have enough room for all the love that needed to fit. Um, and it hurt. <laughs> and, um, you know, I held her, and my husband did not have that experience. He was annoyed. Um, you know, <laughs> she kept us up at night. Uh, and I will say AA was there the whole way. You know, they met us at our, um, they held a baby shower for us a few weeks before we gave birth. And so our house was decked out and ready. And when she came, you know, we, um, no one can really prepare you for what's going to happen or what to expect. You know, they can tell you all their stories. You can talk to a thousand people, but your experience is going to be completely different. And of course, being AA, everyone tells you their experience and their opinion. Um, I had one woman who is adamant still to this day will come up to me and be like, daughters and fathers have the best relationships, daughters and mothers. And I'm just like, oh, thank you. Thank you for your opinion, you know, but I don't agree. You know, I just, I love that little girl. She's perfect. She's perfect. And you know, she's got a long life ahead of her, I hope. And a lot of things can happen, you know? She could be, she's probably gonna be one of us. Um, I hope she's the me of us, because I was a really good kid. He was a terror, um, but given karma, we'll probably get one of him. And, uh, you know, but A is preparing us for all of, all of the future things, you know? And I don't know about you, I'm a little bit of a head tripper, you know? So I'll be, I'll be sitting in the house like, God, what if she, what if she suffocates tonight? It could be tonight. It's probably tonight. It's definitely tonight. Tonight's the night she dies. God damn it, you know? And AA, though, has given me a connection to a higher power where I can say, oh, okay, God, please take away my obsessive thoughts, you know? Or I'll think about like, oh, when she's 16, she's going to die of an overdose. And it's like, well, she's not 16. She just turned one. Like, stay here now. And like, that's the thing too is, you know, AA has given me the ability to be so present. Um, I get to be there for every moment, you know, except for right now when she's with my parents walking. Uh, <laughs> but at least we get videos. Um, I get to be there with her and I get to be with my husband and my parents and all of these things, you know, and they're not things that I ever wanted. You know, I just wanted to be famous. Um, and, and that is just not important anymore, you know? And I was, I will say, so I, I was a very active member of our home group and having a baby has changed that a lot. Um, I went from being at five meetings a week and all the commitments and secretarying and all of these things. I'm a member of GSR um, to now I have two in person and a virtual meeting a week. Um, I share, we, you know, it's like we got divorced and we have to share our home group. You know, we swap meetings and the other one's home with the baby. Um, and then she's also in daycare. So half the time we're all sick, you know, so we're home too. And it's like, oh, and it's just like, you know, it can be very lonely, um, suddenly being so, feeling so disconnected. And I remember calling my sponsor a few months after having her and being like, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm in AA anymore, you know, and um, this is bad. I have to get to more meetings. Like, what am I going to do? And she was like, um, you know what? Right now it's about raising your daughter. This is what you got sober for. 
This is why you went to nine meetings a week in your first years of sobriety. This is why you built an unshakable foundation so that when something like this happened, you could be present for it and be an amazing parent to your daughter. Um, and being someone who likes to like follow all of the rules and do everything right. And like, you know, look at me, I'm doing all of the things. Uh, it was actually really helpful to hear that I was doing it right anyway, you know, even though it didn't look the way that I thought it should. Um, and you know, I have also now gotten to be helpful to other women behind me who are in pregnancy or who are having children. Um, and to help them navigate their meetings and their sobriety. You know, I was a big meditator before giving birth. Um, that's one of the things I really prided myself in is every morning Sloan and I and my belly would sit and do our meditation. Um, and then I had her and what is meditation? You know, like it, it things fall off and um, I, you know, I was 20 minutes twice a day and now it's like, okay, I have three minutes, like just sit and breathe. And it's hard, thank you, um, uh, to stick with the program that I used to have because it's, it's not all for me anymore. Um, and what I'll say too is, you know, after having Sloan, I'm an Irish twin, and so we really wanted to have kids right away um, and like, you know, pop them out. And you know, you forget how awful pregnancy and childbirth are once you're holding that thing and it's just like, baby, get, get one in me. And, uh, about six months after Sloan was born, we had our first miscarriage. Um, and then at 10 months, we had our second. But I am happy to say that we are now due in October. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, and it's a very different, it's a very different experience this time. Um, because I have evidence now of the power of AA and the power of my higher power um, in my life supporting um, my sobriety through parenting and my children, you know? Um, and it's like what William said, it's like, you know, I might not have as much time to give that as I used to, um, but if I give the time that I do have to AA and to my fellow like kids, then God just takes care of the rest, and I really get to trust and believe that today. Um, so with that, I will end, and thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.